Wow. That was fun. <laughs> well, I always say it's an honor, um, but I don't say it flippantly. Um, it really is an honor to be here. I want to go over a few things. Um, it's always a good chance to go over some of the things um, of the house. So if you're here from another church, um, forgive me in the beginning portion of this for it might feel a little bit more koinonia um, than the other stuff um, that you're receiving today, but I hope it still applies because I just want to encourage you about where the church is heading, okay? And so can I pray? My Lord, um, thank you, God, for who you are for how you are, and thank you for your presence. I pray right now, God, that you'd help us to have that prophetic vision for where our next steps are. Keep us from being distracted from all the things that might be so loud in our day. Help us keep our eyes on you, Lord, and help us keep our feet moving. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to talk to you guys about a season of grace. I was reading um, in first or in Ephesians 2. Um, it's not going to be in your notes, but Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's by grace. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So as I was looking back, I want to kind of give you a little bit of where we've come from this past year since our last Emerging Leaders, some highlights of the year. There have been some incredible wins. And even as I go back and I celebrate, this is what the Lord is doing in the house, I have to always remember that it's by grace. It's by grace. As a person who I actually like, you know, I pay the bills sometimes. Sometimes I'm sending the text to get leaders. Sometimes there's a confusion that can happen that can make it be about what we've done. Um, so I would just want to set us up by remembering that everything that happens here is by grace. And I just want to encourage you that there is a, an additional grace on the house in this season, an additional grace. So I believe that all churches, those who follow and, and um, are seeking after the presence of God, there's a grace on all of the body of God or the body of Christ. But when we, um, there are certain seasons where he gives you an extra dose. And I believe we're in that season of a little bit of an extra dose, okay? So there's been some cool things that have happened. Um, one of the things is just earlier this year, we did a prophetic conference. You guys remember when John John and Eric came? That was this year, okay? Sometimes it just feels like far away. Like that was so long ago. That was like January, February. I don't even remember. That was a long time ago. But I actually just, in, in, um, in light of tonight or today, I went and re-listened to and re-watched some of those prophecies. So here's the thing about holding on to prophecy. Um, sometimes we forget that we, were, that we were given a word. Even something that was given to me in January, I had to recall and I was like, oh yeah, God told me that. And so I did a little bit of reminding myself of even what has happened this year. I was given a prophetic word during that time. Um, sometimes when we come into prophetic conferences or prophetic environments, I believe that sometimes a word for somebody else, I can grab onto that word too. I believe that the word is good. I'll steal people's words all the time. I steal them, right? Um, so like if somebody's being encouraged, I can be encouraged by that. And so remembering prophetic moments as a community is important for us. So I'd encourage you, what did you receive during that time? Let's not let it drift too far. So we had our prophetic conference, which was incredible. We had serve day. And anytime we have serve day as a community, it's a win. It's a win. When we put on a serve day t-shirt, we, we lock arms with somebody from another church. I got to work with people who I'd never seen before. I was like, hi, I'm Candice. You know, like they don't know who I am. And that's so nice. You know, like, so they told me their name. You know, this, this is what happens when you get on the stage often as everybody knows my name. And I still don't know y'all's name which is why anytime you come to a conference for me, you're going to have two name tags so that I can learn your names. <laughs> but, you know, you just get to know other people. You get to serve the community, and it feels very um, pure. There's a purity in just getting out there and mowing a lawn. There's a, pure, there's a simplicity of the gospel that I crave sometimes that happens during serve day. So it was a refresher for my soul just to get out there and, and serve with one another. So that was a huge win. 
This is a, a year where we had missions back up and running. Okay, like, um, like uh, Grubby had said earlier, COVID was hard on churches. And travel was hard on churches, like lack of travel. So we have had to, we are a missional church. We send people all the time, and we've had to put a pause on that. And here in 2023, we got to send again. And it was incredible. We got to send again. So that's a huge win for us as a church. Um, so we got to send a, a team um, to the UK. I got to go on that trip. That was incredible. Our students have been serving um, here locally. So missions are back up and running. And that makes my heart glad. Most recently, we just did a prayer walk. Pastor Andrew, he had it on his heart to make sure that we pray for schools well this year. How many of you guys participated in our prayer walk? Yeah, a lot of you, a lot of our leaders. So we got to actually go. So here's the, here's the thing. I pray for schools all the time. It's like a habit. Like when, I've made it a habit. Anytime I hear an ambulance, I'm going to pray. Anytime, yeah. There's just like little stoppers that I've set up in my life. And anytime I pass a school, I pray for it. And it's kind of automatic, right? But now I got to walk on the campus and lay my hands on the principal of the school that I prayed for. And now I pray for that school extra right? There's nothing overly fancy or spiritual really about actually being on the campus sometimes, but what it really does for us is it maximizes our engagement. And when we maximize our engagement, we actually pray a little bit more specifically. We pray a little bit more clearly. And I think the Lord hears our prayers more better, more better, right? And so because we do a better job of praying, I think our prayers are more um, effective, and I really, I'm excited to see and experience. Um, one of the things, is the principal who was with us at, at the school we were at, he was like, you know what? I can do this every day. Like, and so now I'm expecting there to be ripple effects of our time of praying over schools. There was a bus driver with us. He's like, man, I'm going to start praying over my kids. Like there was just like this, there was an idea sparked in the possibility of prayer. It was exciting. And I don't think it's gone, even though that was a really recent event. It's not gone. That exciting, the enthusiasm, um, the, the, the zeal of praying for this generation um, was lit up and I think is still going on. Uh, the finances of the church, which is a part of what I, I oversee, um, they've been really steady. And so in a season where we're looking at inflation feeling like what it feels like, um, it starts to feel like, man, I wonder how the faithfulness of the people will be. You know, you just ask that question, like, man, this might be a tough time. And so when tough times come, um, sometimes generosity is one of the places where we're hit. But I just want to say that our, our finances are actually up 10% this year um, in a year where we were kind of maybe holding our breath a little bit. So just thank you guys so much. It's um, just incredible generosity. We've actually had some incredibly large gifts from people who have sold real estate, um, people who have um, made some big investments and received large chunks of money. And the generosity, I think it's, sometimes it's, it's hard to be generous with a little, but it's also hard to be generous with a lot. And so when you sell a house and then you give 10% off that, that's a huge gift. And so thank you, church. Thank you, leaders. Um, I know that in, in most of the time in churches, it's like there's 10% who pay 80% of the bills. And I can guarantee you 80% of that 10% is in this room. And so I'm super grateful and thankful for you guys um, financially backing and being obedient to what the Lord has told you to do in this house. Um, but th all that to say is um, we're actually entering into a season of looking at our finances really critically because we need some air conditionings. <laughs> we need some air conditioners. Um, I don't know if you guys have walked in the lobby lately. It's hot. Do you guys feel the heat in the lobby? That's because our air conditioning broke yesterday. <laughs> and it breaks often, okay? And so our team, Joe, Lee, Brad, they have become HVAC experts. They, like, are always working on our stuff. Um, multiple times this year and last year, the, the AC in this building, um, in this room, has broken down a few times. And so there's been a few Saturday nights and even Sunday mornings where they're out there hustling. They are working hard to make sure that those air conditionings are working for you guys. But it's now time for us to purchase. Okay, we're now at the point where we need to purchase. We actually just put the first payment down, um, or we're about to put the first payment down. We've ordered the two HVACs for this building, but that's $200,000, right? So it's not tiny things. These are big things. And so as we are looking at our finances, they're strong, but the, some big purchases are coming. And so we're looking at possibly in the near future doing a small capital campaign in order to cover some of the big purchases that are coming. Because we built this building and everything was new all at once. And so what happens when that 
that happens is then everything breaks all at once. <laughs> so we're just like, oh, crud. Um, and so ACs are kind of criti critical for us. We're suspecting that next summer it would be really hot summer for us if we don't fix those right now. So we're working on that. Um, next for us is going to be uh, sound and lights. We're ha you know, have you guys been here on a Sunday when the lights just spaz out. Yeah. <laughs> They're starting to get cranky. You know, our lights are getting cranky. And so before things get too twitchy in here, we're trying to anticipate. And so just know that that might be coming. That's something we're working on, trying to use wisdom and diligence, trying to make sure we're taking care, using our finance as well to make sure that the most important thing, the gospel, is heard without distraction. Right? The, the, the gospel needs to be heard without distraction. And let me tell you, heat is distracting. And so are flashing lights. Okay? And so we got to keep the thing. We got to keep the distraction low. We got to be good stewards of the system so that the gospel could be heard. That's the goal, right? So those things are in the works. We're working on that right now. Um, across the street, we have Future Hope Preschool. This year, we have a brand new director, okay? Uh, Regina Jennings, she's our new director of uh, Future Hope Preschool. And getting a new director means that um, Miss Debbie Cordero is officially retired. Debbie has been, and she did, I, I, she did not give me permission to do this. She's very, very anti like celebration. So this is kind of my little sneak. Um, Debbie Cordero has been an incredible. She's the one who launched that. She's spearheaded it. Um, <laughs> Both my kids went through that preschool under her leadership, and it was not even just what she did for my kids, it was what she did for me as a mother. When I had preschool kids, I had no idea what to do with them. She coached me on how to be a leader in my home, and coached my husband on how to raise up this generation well. The impact that Debbie has had on Kings County is unknown. We have no idea. And so I just want to honor her. I just want to thank her for so many years of serving in Future Hope. It has been powerful. It's been incredible. And she's led with grace and efficiency. Let me tell you, nobody's budget is on point like Miss Debbie's budget, okay? The woman leads so well. And here's the thing. She's, she's laid it down into the hands of another mighty, powerful woman. <laughs> and so I'm so honored to work with these people who just seek the hand of God as they, as they manage the areas of influence that they're given. And so those are some of the changes that are happening. You'll, you'll see more from Regina here soon as we get her um, up and running over there. School did just begin. We have a few more openings. If you guys know a preschooler who wants to be in, we got a spot for you across the street. So while there have been some wins, we have had some tragedies. Um, it would be um, dishonest of me just to be like, everything's great. Um, I, I hate lying. And we've had some hard times. Um, we actually had uh, one of our staff members had some illegal allegations against them recently, and that, that rocks us as a community. That's a betrayal, right? Um, because we, 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 we seek to do things really well, and in order to live with integrity, that means in the front end, in the places that we're not, we're not seeing. Um, and, and it grieves us when there's failure. It grieves us. And so we're, we're walking through that as a team. Um, it's not our pastoral staff, but that doesn't always matter as much, right? It's part of our team. And so um, that's been really hard. We're walking with the families who are affected, um, and it's not without a cost. There's weight there. There's weight there. So that's one of the things that we're walking through. Um, also trying to walk through and make sure that things can't be repeated, right? We don't want to repeat the things that happened. Um, so we're walking through. We're looking at our systems. We're looking at our, the, our protective measures. And we're making sure a repeat is really, really hard to miss. Um, and that's weighty work. It's, it's like the worst kind of work to try to set up systems to protect us from us, right? But that's what we do. Okay, and we're doing that work right now. Um, a, a, a little more than a month ago, there was a shooting downtown right next door to our office. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but one of the, the women who was in the building where the shooting was happening, she ran over to our staff and banged on the door and said, he's coming for you next. And that just elevates the level of fear, right? So our staff had, you know, just kind of this back-to-back -back season of this um, heightened insecurity and heightened fear. And so it's just a little bit of like, it feels like a little bit of trauma, you know, we're kind of going through like a car wreck where we got, you know, um, our heads slammed on both sides really fast. So we're in a process right now of really contending um, for protection from the work of the enemy. 
Okay, it's not, uh, it's not even out of fear. It's out of a realization that as these good things are happening, so, so comes the attack of the enemy. And in that, we want to be, be very shrewd with the way that we, we armor ourselves. We want to be very thoughtful with the way that we um, communicate authority to the enemy. Like, hey, you're not in charge here. We are. And so we're kind of like speaking even to ourselves and the environment, even the grass. You know what I mean? We'll speak to anything. Okay, tree falling down because of that weird wind gust. Like, whatever it may be, we're not going to be shaken. <laughs> you know, and so it doesn't matter what it is, but there, we are in a season where we're feeling that like, whoa, we're feeling that there have been, I, I can't even really count. I, was try, I didn't want to go through the list, but man, so many of our staff members, it's either us or a close member of family dealing with a, a high level of crisis or illness. A ton of us guys, a lot of us are dealing. So then when your personal life feels like, man, I'm holding this crisis, I'm going to do the work of the Lord, the management of the Lord, there becomes a little bit of a fatigue. There's a little fatigue. So I just want to let you know that that has, we're in a hard season. We're in a hard season. And that's how I know it's a season of grace. That's how I know. Because there was a day I came and it was my turn to speak and I felt totally ill-equipped totally ill-equipped, unprepared. It wasn't my turn, but it became my turn last minute. And I was like, I don't know. I like to give this my best and I don't really feel like this is my best. Or it's like my best today, but not my best compared to my best yesterday. You know what I mean? Have you ever had that? So it's not, it didn't really feel that great to be up here. And then Pastor Chad came up and he said, hey, Candace, there's extra grace in the house. And then it lets me let go. I cannot have enough and it can still get done. Okay, I don't have to have it all together and it'll still get done. Okay, there's an extra grace in the house. So some of us are walking through, we're leading, we're prophesying, we're teaching, we're, we're parenting. In the midst of struggle, you don't have to have it all and it can still get done because we're in a season of extra grace. The Lord does the work of covering where our emotions, our body, like where we can't do it all. Man, that's what God says. He says, where you are weak, that's where I'm going to be strong. So that means we get to celebrate our moment of weakness because that's where the extra dose of grace applies. That's where it applies. And so while we've gone through these, these trials, um, it's actually sharpening our prayers. We actually went through a season where there was like this weird gossip just happening on repeat that was causing a lot of um, dysfunction within our staff. And we had to like stand together and be like, no more. You know what I mean? Just like drawing a line. Like we're not gonna, we're not gonna use our words against each other, no more. So when you kind of start to get a sense of what's happening, you gotta, talk, you gotta call it out. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna do that. And so we're not gonna use our words unwisely. We're not going to talk bad about each other. We're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to just complain without upholding the hope of a person's recovery and, and transformation. We're not doing that anymore. And so I'm just going to ask, would you guys be praying with us? Be praying with us leaders, um, because it's been a hard season. It's been a hard season. Second Corinthians 12 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Can we be content today? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Sitting in the grace of God is not without effort. It will take some effort for us to sit in the grace of God and trust that he has it all together. Do we trust him in the middle of our calamities, in the middle of our hardships? Let me talk to you guys about a couple more good things, and then I want to teach you something. Attendance. <laughs> My job is the numbers, okay? It's not always my favorite part of the job, but it's what I do, right? Um, and attendance is growing, okay? So in the house, last year, um, so we have around 340 more people attending now than we did this time last year. 340. That's a significant amount. So what happens when we have kind of a, a jump in the, the category of our number is we're going to feel it, and we might get frustrated if we're not here for the right reasons, so just want to pace us, you know, like when childcare rooms are full, 
because that's always what happens first is we, you know, classrooms close. We actually, actually, right now we need more leaders in our, our children's ministry in order to open up some of those classrooms because there are things growing. We had 50 high school students in class last week, five zero <laughs> in room 206, which does not fit that amount. And so kids are like, nah, like they were leaving <laughs> because there was just too many kids. You know, they were like, I'm going to go sit and, you know, they just left. <laughs> There's too many children. <laughs> Um, and that was a kid making that choice, not even a parent. And so we need, we need, we're going to feel some frustration. We're going to feel some frustration and some breaks in the system because the Lord's on the move <laughs> and the house is growing. And so I just want to um, um, impart to you a little patience um, and maybe a curiosity about how you can be a part of that. How can you be a part of making sure that the systems actually, they expand a little bit like an accordion? We have space to grow. Um, we just not, might need some more people to help make that happen. Um, we have had 95 baptisms this year, which that is amazing. We have had 330 salvations and recommitments this year. 330. So let me just give you some perspective about how good that is. So far this year, we're in August, 330. Last year, the entire year, we had 190. So from 190 to 330, that says to me two things. Okay, we're in a season of grace. And we're getting good at counting. <laughs> Because sometimes people raise their hand and they're like, Wah! we never see them again. And we're like, I think there was like 17 hands. I don't know. We don't really know. So we're getting better at counting. I think that's a legit thing. So let me just show you guys what we're doing and invite you guys to be in on this just a little bit. You know what's going on. Andrew has had it on his heart. We're going we're gonna to help people get saved. Like that's what's going to happen. So he's, he's actually formulating how we do salvations a little bit more proactively. You guys have seen it. You felt it in the house. He invites them. It's this marked moment. And having been able to do it from the platform, seeing the tears in the eyes of the people up front here, it is one of the most moving things you'll ever experience. It's not like people are just raising their hand because I like walking up to the front. Like that's not what's happening here. People are having transformational moments. People are deciding that they want their lives to be forever in the kingdom, right? Such good stuff. And so when, um, when the people come up here, they're actually receiving this and this helps us start that next process for this. Um, this is a little card that they fill out. We contact them during the week. We have these, we have a small team that's growing of people who contact them and ask them how they need to be connected. So we're trying to do a better job of not just counting the hands, but connecting them to community. Connection to community is vital. If a person is new in their faith, it's like sending a baby out to school without any protection. You know what I mean? So we, we want to envelop them in the community of Koinonia. Okay? So we're, we're trying to work on that, but we really do. We need more people because um, 330. It's a lot of people to disciple. It's a lot of people to disciple. And here's what um, Donnie Watson told me this. Her son was in the house, David. He's an incredible man of God, a worship leader. Um, in Hawaii, and uh, he was here one of the Sundays, and he was like, he felt it during the altar call. He said the same thing that Chad said. He's like, there's an additional grace on the moment of salvation in the house. That he's like, something shifted in the atmosphere. It was like, all of a sudden, you can just feel the presence of God go out and touch the hearts. And I was like, I feel it, because I often feel kind of dorky. You know, I feel like, raise your hand, talk to your neighbor. Like, I feel really awkward. <laughs> like, ask them if they want to go up front. Like, I just don't always feel very cool and confident doing that. But let me tell you, it's, it's, it's opening up something in people's hearts. It's working. And that's the grace of God. It has nothing to do with me because I feel like a nerd. You know what I mean? I don't feel good doing it. But man, it's happening. It's working. There's an additional grace. There's an additional grace. So here's what I want to do. I want to invite you into that. The salvation moment doesn't have to be platform centered. The, actually, the best salvation moments, in my opinion, are not platform centered. They're actually one-on-ones. Um, -on there's, there's you leading your children to Christ. It's you leading your spouse to Christ. It's you leading your father to Christ. Those are the moments. Okay, while we don't maybe right now have a method to count those, I'm, I'm not really concerned about that. What, I, what I'm concerned with is that leadership would abdicate their role to the staff when it comes to salvation. Okay, I'm concerned about that. What I'm concerned with is that we want to take on the capacity and the call to say, I will make disciples. Okay, I'm concerned that not enough of us are there. Okay, so what Pastor Andrew just talked about is, are we a people who will, who will go ahead and make disciples this year? Are you going to bring somebody to Jesus this year? Who from your work do you know that needs Jesus? You know someone, right? 
You know someone. Who from your school do you know needs Jesus? You know someone. Who from your neighborhood do you know who needs Jesus? You know someone. And so if we all carry that call, and actually, like I said, right now there's an additional grace on salvation. So stepping into it is actually really easy compared to maybe a season when it doesn't feel as gracious. This is the time when it's like we're all wearing floaties and we're just going to float into it. The Lord has given us a little protection, a little bit of um, an edge. So I want to invite you guys into the process of salvations because you are called and invited to lead others to Christ. You are called and invited to lead others to Christ. Salvation is not just an option that you've chosen. If we teach, if we treat our salvation like, yeah, I'm saved, but that's good for me, not really for everybody else, we're probably not understanding what we have in Christ accurately. If we realize the penalty of not coming to Jesus, when we realize the fruit of living a life in Christ, like the opposition of those two ideas, like the penalty of hell is real. It's real. And if we don't have an urgency about that, that means we must not truly believe it. And sometimes I find myself there where I have forgotten the urgency of eternity. And so I just want to challenge us not to forget the urgency of uh, of eternity and instead be a part of making sure that there's always an invitation. Sunday is not the only place for the invitation. The invitation can happen anytime. So here's just a few steps. Um, You guys are leaders. You probably know all of these, but I just want to give a reminder. On your table, we have placed just a little card, and it might feel elementary, but let me tell you, every salvation prayer I do, I think through this. Okay, I think through these steps where it's like ABC. This is how I should lead somebody in Christ. I think it through. I'm like, oh, do you accept Jesus? Yeah. Do you believe Jesus? Do you confess that Jesus is your Lord? Like I say it. I actually follow this model, and it helps me not feel so weak. Weird, okay, it just helps me feel like, oh, I got, a, I got a framework. So here's how to do it real quick. Number one, pray for an opportunity. Are you actually asking the Lord, will you bring me someone to minister to today? When you wake up, when you're going to go and you're going to drive your bus or you're going to work in your office or you're going to, you know, work on the line wherever you're working, you're going to go and visit those, those patients that you have. Ask the Lord, would you give me an opportunity to share? Give me a chance to share God. When you pray for an opportunity, I really do believe the Lord gives you opportunities. He makes it kind of a little bit more shiny and obvious, like, here's the call. Here's the person. They're saying they're having a hard time, and you're just like, oh, sorry, and you walk by. (laughs) Sorry for you. I'll pray for you later. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that was your opportunity. When you start to pray for the opportunities, they're going to come, and you have to say yes to them. You got to say yes to them. So pray for an opportunity. When I pray for opportunities, it actually puts me on um, on the, the path of listener, When I pray for an opportunity, then I watch for the response. If I don't pray for an opportunity, I actually don't look for the opportunity. Praying for the opportunity starts the paying attention process for me. Lord, would you give me an opportunity? And then I start looking around because I have faith that the Lord's hearing me. I have faith that we're on a team. The Lord is empowering me to do the work, right? I have faith for that. So when I pray for the opportunity, I look out for the way that he shows up. Be aware of the fear of man. Oh man, I struggle with the fear of man sometimes. I am nervous about being rejected because of my faith. I carry that. I really do. And so if, if, but I have to be aware that that has to be smaller than my awareness of eternity. My fear of man has to be smaller than that. Ultimately, um, Jesus walked all the way to the cross, right? I can walk all the way to a conversation, you know, like I can get there and they can be like, you're dumb, get out of here. I'm like, okay, you know, like that was not nearly as bad as the cross, okay, it's not nearly as bad. I can get to the point of rejection. I'm allowed to go there. And it's scary, but we're allowed to get there. We're allowed, okay, we're not, we're not promised security in all of our emotions, okay, and so your fear of man, watch out for how it manifests itself, Okay, be very, very thoughtful. For sometimes, for me, the fear of man, it makes me want to be um, accepted in, in, in avenues and areas that I don't need to be accepted at for those reasons. The fear of man does that to me. Okay, the fear of man makes me want to be a cool staff member or it makes me want to be a cool, you know, soccer mom. Like, I'm the cool one, you know, don't worry, you won't be, a, you know, accosted by the faith when you sit next to me. You know what I mean? Like, there's something of the fear of man that kind of silences the offensive nature of uh, my testimony. It silences it. I don't want to tell people how I was once a wreck. 
You know, I don't want to tell people how I was what's a wretch and now I'm set free. Like that's awkward soccer line conversation. The fear of man gets me there. It silences that. But is, is my love of people or my understanding of heaven and hell bigger? You know, my love for people has to be bigger. I have to have a big love for people um, than my fear of man. The next thing is to know your own story. Do you know how to share your story? Do you know how to talk about why you believe what you believe? What has God done for you? Do you got it handy? Just being able to share, spout off how good God is, is an easy in. Sometimes I'll say things like, um, I have a lot of phrases that just kind of roll off my tongue. I don't even think about it. I'm in Hobby Lobby, and she's like, oh, man, I do. I have one more. I'm like, praise the Lord. You know what I mean? Like, everything's a testimony. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I go to church. You know? <laughs> Sometimes I have to, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's me. Um, but it's just being, being okay with just demonstrating our faith, even in the small things, um, sharing how you're grateful, and you, you point at the owner of that gratitude, like the 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 distributor of the reason for your gratitude to Jesus, that's, that's an opportunity to share, like, I have something to offer. And here's the thing is people, everybody's a spiritual being. And if you don't have Jesus, you're on the hunt, right? Like our soul is crying out for the Lord. And so we're not like trying to be like cajole people all the time. We're actually just trying to let it, let it be known that I got what you need. I got what you need. Their soul already knows they need it. Their spirit already knows that they need it. Okay, we're just kind of letting it, we're just kind of pitching it sometimes. We're allowing it to like agree with the the cry that's already in them, right? So they're like, oh, you're a spiritual being. Maybe I can talk to you. You know, like just allowing it to get out there, sharing your story. Like, man, I was, the Lord's always watching out for me. I get to share sometimes because my husband's in law enforcement and sometimes there are tragedies that happen that affect all of us wives. Um, A lot of the people on the department are men and so there's a lot of wives sitting on the sideline and sometimes I get to just be like, well, the reason why I'm not freaking out yet is because I'm in prayer right now and I believe that that works. And if you want, I can pray for you too. We could pray together. Like sometimes that's an opportunity I get to have. Like in what, what life naturally brings, I get to let them see how I'm handling it because I'm a woman of God, right? So just knowing your testimony, knowing why, how you operate, letting that be a part of what's on your mouth more regular. Um, get familiar with the gospel. This is actually, if you ever interview here at Koinonia, it's one of the interview questions, what's the gospel? And I tell you, it's silly how many people get it wrong. Okay, Um, one of the persons I I interviewed recently, I said, hey, um, what's the gospel? They're like, you know, do the best you can. And then, you know, it's all going to work out. I was like, cool. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, just like, what, what are we doing here? What's the story? You know, the, the sin has broken connection with us and the Lord. The Lord is Lord of all. He's actually the boss. I'm not the boss. But because of his love for us, he made a way for me to be in relationship with the creator of the universe. And the only way into that is by saying yes to him and living for him. Do you know the gospel? Can you say it? Can you just, you know, do you know what the story is? So get familiar with the gospel. The, Jesus is Lord of all. He's in charge. And so we may sin, we may, be in, um, we may be trapped by sin, but he made a way for us to be free. And Jesus is the only way. It's okay to just ask. Sometimes we feel real nervous about just asking how a person's spirit is doing. But let me tell you, um, as a person who is a spiritual being, when you ask how my spirit is doing, it does feel like affection. And sometimes affection, when a person is hurting, it actually feels like an accusation. So when people are hurting, they might take your attention about their spirit to feel like an accusation, but it's still okay to ask because we know it's affection. It's like when we go to students, we go to young people, and we're like, man, it's, it's obvious something's wrong. How are you doing? They're like, nothing, leave me alone. You know what I mean? Like, they just don't want to be bothered. And you're just like, I'm just loving you, you know? And that's how it is. And when people are lost, when they're hurting, and we ask about their spirit, it can be offensive off the bat. But man, it's love to ask. It is love to ask. So sometimes when you get that quickening in you and you get that, the Holy Spirit just speaking to you and being like, hey man, they have something wrong. And I bet you, you could, you know, like you kind of got that thing, like just ask, just ask, just ask anything. Don't let the invitations to what's happening in their world beyond surface level go on dead ears. Just ask. And then sometimes you're like, hey, do you believe in Jesus? Do you, are you curious? Can I tell you a little bit why I believe in Jesus? 
leading them in prayer. That's where that card comes in, leading them in prayer. I love to lead people in prayer and have them be a part of it because when our mouths move, it makes it feel more official. And then last but not least is some follow through. Then now what? And that's what we're trying to get better as, as like a, a church family. Um, but here's a few things that I know are important about follow-up is I encourage a person when they first come to Jesus is to go tell somebody important to them. Who do you need to tell about what you just did? Do you need to go tell your mom? Do you need to go tell your best friend? You got to tell somebody, you got to confess it. You got to let it be a story that has words. Um, invite them to come to church with you. I tell you, there's nothing like being in the, the people, being with the people who have all been transformed. Um, we have a thing, Pastor Andrew mentioned it, called the Purple Book. It's kind of the basics of the beginning stages of discipleship. It answers a whole ton of questions. Would you consider going through the Purple Book with them? Just be like, we'll meet once a week. I'll pay for the coffee at 111. <laughs> and then encourage them to start reading the Bible. I always tell people, like, you don't got to understand it, but you got to get in it. It's like Shakespeare. When I was a kid, we had to read Shakespeare in school, and I did not understand, but praise the Lord, I had one of those books that was like Shakespeare and then a translation of Shakespeare on the other side. And eventually, as I was reading Shakespeare, I didn't need that other page anymore. At first, when I was first doing it, I had to read that page. Then I read the other page exactly. Otherwise, I had no clue what they were saying. But after I started getting into it, I didn't need it anymore. And that's kind of how the word of God is. At first, you're like, what is this <laughs> weird text? And don't be afraid by that. And some of you guys, I can see you nodding. Like, you're there or you've been there. And you're just like, I don't even know. Encourage them to get started. I always start with Jesus. I tell somebody to start with Jesus. Start reading about the Lord. Start reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. John's my favorite. Start reading in the Gospels. Read it with them. There's such a beauty of partnership. When, you're, when you've gotten a chance to, to call somebody into the kingdom alongside of you, and then you say, hey, I'll walk with you after, it's one of the most powerful things you could do for another person. I won't let you be lost. I won't let you get forgotten. Can you be a part of that, guys? This is how we change the world. This is how we change Kings County. We make disciples. We make disciples. And I do believe, I do believe part of making disciples is inviting them to church. I don't want to ever discount that, okay? I don't want to ever discount that. You can, you can skip all of what I just said and be like, do you want to go to church with me? You can get there. <laughs> and then like, Andrew will do the thing. You know what I mean? But I just want to <laughs> do it, Andrew. <laughs> get him. Um, <laughs> but it's not outside of your ability. And it's not outside of what you, you've been called to do. You can bring somebody to Christ this year. When I think about New Year's resolutions, is bringing somebody to Christ on, on the goal? Is it on the list? I want to haunt for Who am I bringing to Christ this year? I met a guy. Um, he was a student, and he, he's from a, a country that's a lot more strict than ours. And um, he was in Bible school at that, that very strict country. And in order to graduate, he had to bring 300 people to Christ. Ha! <laughs> So he had like this notebook where he's like, do you, do you, like, he, honestly, it made it so everywhere he went, he's like, do you know Jesus? No. Do you want to? Okay, let's pray. And he was like, smash, you know, like checking him off. 300 people by graduation. Some of us have never gotten one. It convicted me. Also made me like, Whoa, thank you, Lord, for America. Like, I don't even know how to live under that pressure. I don't know how to do it. I'm a free girl. You know, I don't, don't tell me what to do. Um, but like, he was on it because he had a mission that was given to him by his professors. But still, right? He just showed me how possible. I was like, well, what number are you at? He's like, I got like 200. I was like, oh, my gosh. 20-year-old kid, 200 salvations. Just crazy. But his whole class was doing it. His whole class was doing it. Sometimes we make it such a big deal, and it is, but it's not, um, it's not going to kill you. <laughs> it's probably going to kill your pride. It's probably going to kill your convenience. It's probably going to kill your schedule. It's probably going to kill, you know, it's going to kill some things, but it's not going to kill you, at least not here. And while we live there, man, while we live in the freedom that we do, we should be loud about it. We should be very, very loud about who Jesus is and the fact that everybody needs him. Jesus is everything. He's everything. I don't know how people are married without Jesus. I don't know how people parent without Jesus. I don't know how people stay healthy in any way, shape, or form without Jesus. I don't know how they do it because I couldn't do it without him. I believe that. And if I believe that, how come we're not saying it, 
right? Let's tell somebody. Let's bring them in. Let's bring them into the kingdom, okay? You've got the tools. You've got the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have the, you have the holy God of all things talking directly to you, guiding you. You're not without resources. You have the resources of heaven at your disposal. Will you consider bringing somebody to Christ this year? Bring them in. And then tell me so I can count it. <laughs> I don't know. We'll figure that out later. <laughs> if you guys just start bringing them in, I'm like, let's go. I'll start a tally somewhere. Can I pray for you? And then we'll get into a snack, a little bit of a break. So my God, would you raise your hands right now? My God, right now with our hands raised, we say, Lord, would you, would you give us an opportunity? Would you give us a vision for our neighborhood, our schools, our families, Lord? Would you help us be the one to bring them in? Would you help us not to be complacent? Would you help us not to be comfortable? Would you help us to be um, fully in the additional grace that there is right now in Salvation's Equinonia? Would you help us answer the call? Lord, would you give us faith for it? I struggle, Lord. My faith struggles sometimes, God, and I need you. I pray right now against the fear of man. I pray that we would not be afraid or too afraid. I pray that where there is fear, you would replace it with boldness. I pray that where there is insecurity, God, that you would give us a strategy. Lord, would you whisper to us the name of a person right now that even today we need to text and invite out, that we need to just reach out to and make sure that we stay present in their lives a little different because they need the light of the world. They need the light of the world. And my God, I pray for every person who's going to come in this house tomorrow who doesn't know you, God. My God, would you allow their hearts to be open to your spirit? Would you allow their hearts to be on fire for you by the time they leave? I pray, God, that there would be transformational moments, that this would be a house of worship. It would be a house of transformation, that even the fibers of the carpet would start to electrify something inside of them that says, this place is different. There is a peace here. There is a, there is a hope here, my God. I pray for those who come in feeling hopeless, my God. Would you just breathe in an understanding that they are cared for, they are seen. They are invited. They belong, my God, into something greater. And I pray that there would be freedom, freedom from sins, freedom from bondages, God. Would you set people free, even in this space right now, even here at Emerging Leader, God, would you set us free? I pray for more freedom, <laughs> more freedom, my God, that I would be more free to do your work and your will. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.